So you didn't you didn't uh, come through a traditional filmmaking academic background, but where did you learn about movies and develop those interests? And then when you were first picking up a camera, whether it was actually picking up a camera or just deciding I want to be a filmmaker, just using a camera as a, a, a metonym, like if when you were first doing that, um, what were some of those early um, things that you were told, this is how you make a movie. Mm -hmm. And well, let's start there. What yeah, were some yeah. of those things? I mean, you know, I started in the, you know, in the nineties, my, 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 uh, my father, he was a, you know, a, in Egypt, he had a studio and a, you know, he was a film producer and distributor, you know, Amer you know, he'd be one of those, if there was an American movie, he'd be kind of the foreign contact for, you know, Egyptian distribution and as well, he, you know, produced his own film. So, you know, growing up, it was always just nonstop talking about movies. Um, but he never laid out, I don't think any kind of rules that I can remember about what makes, what makes a film. It wasn't until, you know, I, and I think my first entry into a film festival, <laughs> official selection was some local horror film festival in the nineties. So mm -hmm. I, I wasn't thinking about rules then either, but you know, after uh, you know a decade of failed <laughs> theater pursuits, then I'm like, why? Why did I get into theater in the first place? And a lot of it had to do with, oh, I wanted to make shorts, but I went through this kind of circuitous route out of fear and security. Like, well, if I'm if I'm funny in front of an audience, then I'll, I'll know how to you know write funny. So I just went uh, through there. So once I figured out or kind of learned the basics, or got a little confidence in writing and seeing how an audience listens to words. Um, after that failure, you know, unending failure, I thought maybe I'll go back to the original intention of um, making these shorts. And then that was, you know, YouTube University. And, you know, the most consistent rule is, you know, don't break the 180 rule, which is a very valid rule. And I get, I think it's, you know, break it when you want to jar the audience or have some kind of unexpected impact. Um, I think that's probably the simplest first rule. And mm -hmm. I think uh, the second one that stood out is sound beats image quality. And that is, I think, kind of cardinal for me of like, just get great sound. <laughs> you know, you can shoot on an iPhone or whatever, but it, no, if it's crunchy or clipped or um, sounds like it's coming through a telephone, no one can stand more than 10 seconds of it. So that's interesting because, um, well, both of those two things are. So like, I think one of the first, uh, lessons I was was taught or at least learned about uh, and you know I, given what I've already stated about my personality I didn't necessarily take to it but one of the first things people um, said to me teachers and, and whatnot was that you have to uh, learn the rules in order to be able to break the rules oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and I definitely that that seems like a, a fair statement mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really question that one. But secondary to that, I think one of the very first things that I can remember is sitting in like a film 101 class, introduction to production or something like that, and learning about was film is a visual medium. And I immediately kind of questioned that from the start. Um, and it's funny to hear you say that sound trumps uh, visuals. Um, and I think filmmakers will know what you mean by that in, in that, you know, essentially people, an audience is, is more likely to put up with something that looks not as great, but has sound clarity than vice versa. It's a more frustrating, uh, viewership, viewing experience to, uh, experience something that where the sound is just, we are constantly like, wait, what happened? What did they say? Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when I first heard that film is a visual medium, I think uh, my, I, I kind of sat up uh, in my chair a little straighter just because I, I've always thought about the importance of sound um, and how it's really a audio visual medium. Yeah. And it's oftentimes sound is neglected, uh, in, especially at the low budget range. Mm -hmm. um, sound is, uh, I think sound is neglected at the, at the low budget range for a myriad of reasons, everything from budget to mm -hmm. 
resources, other resources to having been taught that film as a visual medium. Yeah. And then on the high budget uh, side of things, I, th I don't think it's neglected, but I think it's disrespected. Yeah, I don't think they get enough time. I think what well, on average it might be like ten days of you know yeah. mixing, if not less. It's not given the importance, and you can see that from everything from like nobody cares who wins the sound oh, like Academy Awards, mm -hmm. or they don't know those people. They're not uh, unless you are a sound person and you geek out about that sort of stuff. Those people aren't known to the vast majority of of you know both filmmakers and audiences. Um, and so that was one of the things I immediately kind of, uh, questioned. Um, mm -hmm. and I well, think that's the one that haunts me the most too, is that it is a, a, a visual, cause I said, you know, visual quality versus I think the image is still important. I think yeah. that's also where that one lesson is my hang up because I remember reading David Mamet's on directing, specifically film directing. And it was just like this concept of the uninflected image, each, each shot ideally is an uninflected image that can kind of capture or portray or set up the next thing without exposition, without sound mm -hmm. exposition. And, you know, I think that's why, you know, some of the silent film directors are great because it's uninflected storytelling and, you know, sometimes you get ham acting, but I think that's where I also struggle with that rule of it is a visual, visual medium, but, you know, it is both audio and visual. But uh, for me, the challenge is how can I make it, how can I still honor the image or uh, think through image versus, oh yeah, I can just do, <laughs> you know, voiceover over it or have someone dialogue it out. Yeah. Um, no, for sure. How can you, I think, like, how can you complicate and, and, and merge the two? Mm -hmm. yeah. How can, how can each add to one another mm -hmm. is really the question that we want to get at. I think when people are giving you that rule at a kind of introductory phase, what they're trying to guard against is uh, an over-reliance on, uh, on sound, on yeah. dialogue, on, on uh, yeah, the auditory, like, you know, like you said, exposition and whatnot. Um, and exposition is actually something we should also come back to because I have strong feelings about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you said it well in that, like if they're, working together if there is a dialogue <laughs> between the two um that's the that's the sweet spot uh, mm -hmm. and um you know it's something that i i've definitely tried to you know i think uh i've gotten better as a visual director i am a very um you know i i actually really love dialogue um and maybe that is coming from i'm not i've never had a strict theater background but I've always hovered around that world um, and you know coming from uh, theater and, and, and literature and like you know stuff like that has really made for um, in my personal style and direction wanting to have uh, dialogue be an emphasis mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that it has uh, that uh, the visuals can slump because yeah. of that. Um, but uh, I do really enjoy those types of films. And a lot of the directors that I really admire um, are, have tons of dialogue, or at least it, the dialogue within their films is both uh, necessary and um, vital to what mm -hmm. they've been able to convey through via cinema. We've kind of talked about uh, where you where you initially started off mm. and how you kind of learned those things. But in your time in doing this for however long you've been doing it, have you now developed tendencies that are Mishuisms, for the lack of a better term, that um, they're kind of unique to you on some level? Yeah, I honestly, um, yeah, I don't. I really, I really wouldn't know, to be honest. I don't, yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll watch over my work. <laughs> um, I think it goes back to, I just like, I like talky, I like people talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And why is that really, important to you? Why is it important? Um, I think it's just what I'm interested in, right? Like, I'm not, I think I'm just interested in people with, you know, maybe intellectual or self-imposed dilemmas 
which I think probably comes from, you know, living with comfort and privilege in the 21st century in America of like, this is what my hangup is, which is like, if you look at most of the Pulitzer Prize winning plays of the past hundred years, I think more than half of them are about adultery, right? Um, or, uh, you know, kind of these middle-class hangups. So I think that's maybe just a kind of a, a byproduct of my own, um, you know, uh, background, right? Like, well, I, I, I think I'll just write about people who are a little, have a little bit of ennui and they're trying to break out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the hierarchy of needs is self-actualization, right? It's not about survival. It's about these characters who are trying to uh, search for something that they probably don't need, but they think they need or they're looking for. I think that's probably um, where I'm at least my kind of um, level of uh, maybe comfort is or just being a little bit more vicariously, uh, you know, ex having had experience, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is there something particular to uh, perhaps like so f with me I love the the music of language I just mm. love hearing like on a very basic level words and how different people uh, use different words mm -hmm. and um, how new words are created and linguistically how we either communicate or oftentimes, maybe more oftentimes, uh, the inability to communicate through language, even when words are being spoken. All of that, uh, all that jazz is is great, um, uh, and I and I mean that in in every sense of the word. Just like kind of the improvisation of uh, of conversation mm -hmm. um, is is sometimes as fascinating as any uh, elaborate action sequence that yeah. I could conceive of. Mm -hmm. uh, now that also may be because I am not the best person to think of an action sequence. Maybe I don't think in those sorts of ways. So then I fall back on uh, what I do know or what I think I know. Um, but uh, is there anything uh, to that for you in terms of uh, just kind of, uh, you mentioned plays and your theater background. A lot of that 20th century playwright, like, you know, the Tennessee Williams, like, has been adapted so many times to, mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to the cinema. And I think a lot of that, like, you know, when you get into that film 101 class and they say, don't use dialogue or don't be talky, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not exactly true either. Because when, when you have the dialogue of Tennessee Williams, it works because there's yeah. something cinematic about it. It's mm -hmm. not, it's, it's not exclusively working in the mode of exposition. There's a poetry and a music and a uh, non, there's non-communicative uh, qualities to it as well that are cinematic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I also, I also remember reading that like lyrical poetic language doesn't, necessarily work for cinema because it just something about you know it's either too stylized or kind of the truth of the moment's like oh people don't talk like that so i think maybe that's might be one hang up of a 21st century filmmaking is um i don't know if it was frank gary who was talking about this about minimalism how you reach a point where it's just a room with white walls right so mm -hmm. you can say the same about maybe minimalist acting where when are we going to reach a point where it's just we're looking at white walls so i think there's value in style and at the same time i also think there's something so potent and powerful about simplicity but how do you how do you um acknowledge simplicity isn't the same as minimal right as doing nothing so i think a lot of maybe indie filmmaking is mistaking the point of simple powerful performances that could look like minimalism right um mm. so what's that have to do with uh, lyrical language. So the dangers of lyrical language is it's it's too stylized. It becomes artificial, right? And I think yes. artifice versus truth. Um, but how can you have stylistic language or a context that the audience is protected and they're ready for stylistic language? I think a blind spotting oh, was probably a great example where uh, I believe the filmmakers prompts when they were making the movie over like 10 years was Oakland and spoken word poetry. 
those were like their constraints and they made it. Um, but I think the audience is prote protected in that example versus some where it's just like, look at us, you know, have a, like a cute monologue that's very lyrical out of nowhere that might not read. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, at each work, one of the another lesson that I'm recalling is uh, somebody at some point said to me, "Each work teaches you how to read it, mm. read it, uh, and um, or at least should aspire to have a, <laughs> some way where you're teaching an audience how to uh, to to take it in." And um, at least in a lot of the best of work um, that I encounter, when it is true to your point that when you're doing something that is perhaps a little bit more stylized or a little bit more artificial or theatrical or whatever word that you want to put on that, um, that there has to be uh, a doorway for people to enter. If they're sitting there searching for the, a door mm. uh, the entire time, that's where a frustration is going to, mm. to come into play. That I felt yeah, and maybe maybe it doesn't even have to be a door like but like you know maybe there's a window somewhere that's mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or just a hole in the wall crack in the wall but they, there has to be something where you're uh the audience isn't feeling like they've been left uh, to you know left out to dry or whatever um and that there's a little bit of uh something for them to hang on to mm -hmm. perhaps yeah I think it's it's tough because I, I didn't necessarily go through like a formal uh, kind of filmmaking training process. I started in theater, um, and I think this maybe more theatrical notions of you know it's about the relationship, um, and I think that became a sort of the, the guiding principle of uh, conflict and relationship. Like uh, these two people you're seeing on stage are the most what you're seeing is the most important thing to be seen, right? So why are you uh, you can't waste the audience's time with I don't know, uh, it being vague or it being unclear. Um, so I think the idea of, you know, clarity was, pro uh, clarity or context was king. I think that was probably one of the earliest maybe theatrical notions, context and clarity being uh, very mm -hmm. important. And I think, you know, I, I kind of just accepted it as, you know, truth. And I, I think there's a lot of value in it and it's important. And at the same time, I know you've talked about it, maybe even others, you know, <laughs> let room in for mystery right mm, yeah but i think um that would probably be one of the core principles you know it's about the relationship it's about these two people or the people you're seeing on stage or on camera and anything you know if you're if you see two people on camera and they're talking about someone who's not in the frame it's probably going to be a fairly boring scene unless i get it you know it's exposition but how can you make it immediate you know between mm. these two people so maybe we should talk about style since we've started sort of started delving into that do you have a uh what you would consider a style is style important to you do you have one um and to the degree that you can that you can or would want to talk about it what do you feel like that style what what do you think you're trying to cultivate yeah i mean i, I yeah i don't think style is necessarily um important to think about i think it's going to come i think it comes out through someone's own aesthetic preferences and choices right you know um so i i i think very rarely do i think about um style i think it's whatever my interests are are probably what guide me to the decisions i've made you know and maybe because it is low budget or i'm mindful of low budgetness is maybe why i'm already drawn to talky directors you know i love you know, great dialogue. I, I can comfortably sit through my dinner with Andre and be like, yes, yes, one location. Um, but I think I am drawn toward, I, another reason why I think I love dialogue is because it's a heady thing, right? If I'm a heady person and overthink things and I'm going to be drawn to characters, characters who are talking and thinking and exploring versus, you know, running through the woods, chopping down trees. Like I, that's not a life I think about. Um, I do, I do like, um, if I do use style, it's for um, constraints, usually mm -hmm. budgetary, but um, to give myself um, very uh, targeted focus of, you know, this next project is just going to be three people in one room or uh, there's going to be, it's going to be black and white because I don't want to think right now about color. I just want to think, or I don't want to think about, you know, set dressing and, 
you know, costume coloring. I just want to think about uh, this is going to be an exercise in editing. So I think for me, it's more um, there's exercises and there's stories. And when I'm work, when I'm curious about exercises, that's when I might play with the style. During the course of this back out of the conversation, I was I was reminded that <laughs> this is this might seem like a left field sort of thing, but I'll say it anyway, and we can edit it out if it doesn't prove productive. But uh, during quarantine, uh, I guess my quarantine brain started uh, just brainstorming a bunch of uh, bullshit, what I've termed, Love that it. I've seen in, 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 in film. Like, I started a list uh, basically saying, cut this out, stop, we need to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if I could just run by a couple of these things. Uh, That'd be great and see like if you had any uh, response to them. Perfect. Um, and they're, they're, some of them are kind of silly, but whatever. Um, so we kind of already talked about establishing shots and, and reverse shot. How, what do you feel about um, like the, let's just, let me just throw out like the term high key lighting. What, like what, how do you feel about how lighting is being used in, in, in current cinema? And, do you have any strong feelings about it? I mean, I, I get it. It saves time as a production value, but, and, you know, again, it's that default, right? It's certain studio flicks or even Netflix kind of jams. So the Netflix B pictures, as I like to think about them. Yeah. Um, yeah, just high key lighting. It's, you get all your shots and it's, it's again, a, a zero point of view. It's like the over the shoulder or a two shot where there's no real point of view in that it's just, you're going to you're going to probably rely on music and color to provide any kind of emotional resonance but when it's just a, a flat light i think it's safe and that's maybe that's the intent of it a lot of comedies are key lighting which i think i wish more comedies had dramatic you know stereo type lighting but um yeah it doesn't i think it probably bothers you more than it bothers me but i do i do clock it video village i can't stand like I, yeah, I, I just assume everything, just treat it like film. Like I would never, my instinct yeah. right now, unless I'm, I'm not, I don't you know, think I'll be doing any CGI stuff for 10, 20 years or never, but there's no reason to ever show an actor their performance. That's just, I just don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessary. <laughs> I, I'm almost of the school of thought, like there's no need to have even like a video assist really. Yeah. If yeah. films, Look at all the films that were created without video assist. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say no reason, because uh, I guess you could be doing something very, like, technically advanced yeah. and, and what have you, and you need to see it. Right. There. But for, I'm going to say for the vast majority of things that get shot in films, especially mm -hmm. like stuff like we're talking about doing dialogue stuff, uh, character driven stuff, two people in a room having an emotional experience type stuff. You don't need to like be by the camera and look at the actors, look at what's before you, mm -hmm. you know, um, if that can work for literally every film up until, I don't know, 70s, 80s or whatever, uh, certainly 90s, then I think that's a, been a pretty good technique. And yeah. any level of as you were talking about earlier, mediation that you're adding to the mix is just one step more removed mm -hmm. from the thing that you're trying to capture. So whenever possible, yeah, I'm not going to make a definitive, I will never have a video assist on my set sort of like yeah. dogmatic statement, but I, I really, I think it slows down the work. Mm -hmm. With everybody constantly looking at it, I think that uh, it makes people self-conscious, as you're saying, like in terms of actors and whatnot. And um, unless there's a real, real specific need to have it, I'm, I'm want to to ignore it and or not mm -hmm. use it at all. Well, again, it also goes back to a fetishization and obsession with continuity and perfection, right? Like, oh no, this, <laughs> you know, maybe the mic dropped in. All right, that happens. That's a bad take, but yeah, I think it just, now you have 12 people watching, obsessing, uh, wanting to whisper into the ear of the AD or the director, a flaw, right? This is a flaw I saw. Another decision needs to be made. Do I move on or do I listen to the flaw this person points out versus 
being present and just seeing what what's going on and going from there and kind of I also think there's a risk in living with the decisions you make on set you know like Mm -hmm. all right we moved on yeah for sure there's a bit of um what's that psychological test that 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 was like a meme in like the early I want to say early 2000s where they had the um the video of like people I don't know dribbling a basket say what gorilla I think it's the change yeah. blindness. Right, yeah, exactly. And like people are dribbling or juggling or something and then an the elephant narrator, walks or yeah. Right. The the narrator goes, Okay, you noticed the juggling, but did you see the the bear in the background dancing, moonwalking or whatever? Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually a pretty good metaphor for what directing is. Yeah. If you are doing focusing people's attention at the right um place at the right time then the mic that drops into the frame not saying that i want mics dropping in my frame Mm -hmm. i don't whenever possible but like (laughs) when the mic drops in the frame or the actor doesn't get the exact line right or whatever the thing that's the imperfection Mm -hmm. uh when you're doing it correctly, those things aren't going to be noticed. They're not going to matter. They're at least they're, yeah. they're certainly going to matter a lot less than people think that they matter when they're hoving about vi- video village, mm-hmm. thinking that yeah, <laughs> every little thing is going to. I haven't implemented this into my process yet, but I do think I want to break down moments in my scripts or even lines and like grade them on importance. To be like, does this warrant more than two takes? Probably not. <laughs> you know, my, I get bothered by a two, three, five cinematic aspect ratio for things yeah. that don't warrant something that requires yeah. a wide, <laughs> wide shots. Yeah, no, that is, yeah, there, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I remember the ex- exact moment in uh, like, like it was early 2000s when I was like in film school and everybody's like, all right, I can find, like, because I have black bars on this, that makes my film the equal of Lawrence of Arabia. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, no, because you just shot it in your apartment bathroom. And <laughs> it's just a short film about, like, your cell phone falling in the toilet. And <laughs> look, maybe there's some cause for that at different aspect ratio at some point in your career or... Or maybe you can even justify it in your bathroom, uh, in your bathroom short film at some point. But this right here isn't doing that. Do you have any feelings about the word content? Never use that word. You know, we're, oh, to, to someone, when I see someone who says they're a filmmaker and content maker, or they don't even say they make films, it's just like, you, because what you become is you become a part of the machine. When you, when you refer to your work as content, it's no longer work, right? It's byproduct it's commercial, it's, it's consumable, it's commodity. So anyone, you know, I don't think you'll ever hear, um, uh, you know, Agnes Varda referred to, refer to his work as content or, uh, you know, any, any kind of person who's spent a lifetime doing work, right? Content isn't work. It's, it's sanitized corporate products for your YouTube monetized ad revenue. And that's, I don't think a lot of people, at least who I admire where their heart is seems to be about creating a body of work, not monetizing their content. I could mm-hmm. probably, we we've probably talked about it, but <laughs> it's my, one of my least favorite words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's more in the, I guess something can uh, be termed content. Uh, you know, it's, it's that, it's that labeling of something as content. It's kind of a perspective on it, You could, you could, potentially create the same thing but then that label i think does a lot of that uh of what you described uh, the ickiness of <laughs> of just the 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 need to constantly be uh having having it monetized and, and churning it out in a, in a you know has connotations of uh, uh an assembly line um mm-hmm. in a i mean but you know like the original studio system was an assembly line on some uh, 
some level. Um, so I'm conflicted about it in the sense that I uh, recognize uh, artists need to exist and, and, and to thrive and to uh, uh, have uh, avenues of, of, of self uh, finance or what have you. But at the same time, I do think it devalues it as kind of what you're saying. So. Yeah, and I, it's, you know, different roads. You know, I'm sure there are people we admire who make music videos and even commercials because the money is just great. I just, I think it's for kind of the, the, the point of focus of like, if that's what's in your heart or if that's top of mind is I'm going to create some content this weekend. Yeah. I just think it's going to be approached a little bit more uh, quickly, probably. Um, it's disposable. A little bit, yeah, more disposable. And I guess, you know, we all die and the earth will be dust in, you know, a few million, billion years. So everything's going to be right. disposable and forgotten. Um, so then that goes back to my hang up around of quality of distribution, right? Where there's a fetishization of a cinematic theatrical release versus a YouTube release or a Vimeo release, you know, or a private screening. And I think that's a different discussion, but it goes back to that idea of the difference between content and maybe the work.